Okay, let's move on and let's move to, to this summary of fluid flow modeling. Um, and maybe it will be a bit more clear for you why I have started with battery at all with the convective transport and diffusive transport and coming up with the form of the, um, of the general conservation law. And that's generally because I want to show you that the Navier-Stokes equations that we use for fluid flow modeling uh, are well, strongly connected to the form of, the, um, of these differential models. Mm. But let's start with something less elaborate, uh, namely, well, certainly you know that <coughs> if we want to solve fluid flow, we need to, and, and I'm talking about the, mm, the incompressible flow, we need to have at least two equations. What are they? Continuity and momentum. Exactly. So continuity equation and momentum equation. The first one, the continuity equation, is the equation that expresses the mass conservation. Uh, and the other uh, equation is the equation that basically is the second uh, Newton's second law. Uh, and it expresses the conservation of mechanical momentum. Mm, so let's start with the continuity equation and let's see the following. Namely, we've got this general form and let's replace our general quantity U. Right now, let's replace it by the density of the material row. And let's assume there is no diffusive transport and clearly if we've got only one one substance there is no diffusive transport um, it's, it's problematic to, to talk about uh, diffusion if in itself um, because nothing would change so and uh, we do not have any store strength because generally mass cannot be produced uh, so we omit this term and this term and what we come up with is something like that the time derivative of, um, of rho plus the divergence of the rho times velocity, this one needs to be zero. And it's nothing else than mass conservation and in fluid mechanics we call it continuity equation. Okay, let's now analyze some, some simplifications that are common. Let's assume that we deal with the fluid that whose, whose density is, is constant. This means all liquids, uh, as I mentioned, often this, this, this applies to gases uh, like a typical gas velocity that we can still assume as being incompressible uh, is a 0.3 Mach number, which in normal conditions is approximately 100 meters per second in flow velocity. So many, many, many engineering cases can be can kind of fall into this category. Uh, if we assume that the density is constant. And obviously, the time derivative vanishes. Uh, what happens then is, because this one is constant, it goes out uh, of the differentiation. So we've got um, rho times the divergence of the velocity field. This one equals zero. And obviously, if that's just a constant, we can, we can omit that. Uh, it's, the, it's the usual form that you probably see when you mention incompressible flows. The divergence of the velocity field needs to, needs to vanish. And then the, the second thing that we need to cover 
uh, once we went through the mass conservation is obviously the momentum conservation. So as I said, Navier-Stokes equations uh, that represent uh, that well, that um, describe the that govern the fluid flow are nothing else like the um, second Newton's law. And first, I want to tell you what I will not mention. And then I will mention what I want to mention. Uh, so, not to mention is I will be not covering today I will not cover today the Euler equations. That's also one of the equations of motion that applies to what? Uh, in case of exactly, to in these two cases. Uh, both compressible and incompressible. But uh, in most cases, Euler equations are used for modeling the High velocity, high velocity flows, uh, because for high velocities the approximation of having no no viscous forces uh, in some cases may be may be reasonable. Uh, although with the increase in the computational performance of the today's machines, I think the oil, oil equations are less and less commonly used. But especially in the past, for high speed aerodynamics, oil equations were. Uh, were used very, very often. Uh, I do not want to cover that because I really do not remember any cases that we've been using Euler equations in our work. Um, what I will not mention either, um, I will not at all mention the compressible compressible Navier-Stokes equations uh, because very, very often what we do is we deal with incompressible flows. So I would rather want to focus on the numerical methods for incompressible flows. They will be much more useful for you uh, in your work. And um, OK, we, we have dealt with that uh, at equivalency not once and not two times. Um, but mainly with, I think in most cases we've been using commercial codes for engineering services. In some, in some applications we've been using uh, compressible flows modeled in different ways, rather 1D or 2D. Uh, in, the, in our codes where we, where we really needed to implement uh, the numerical methods. But it doesn't happen very, very often. Um, and the third thing that I will not cover today is the Bernoulli equation. It's also, let's say, a form of the um, of the um, equation of motion that is integrated along a certain path line. Uh, maybe it's just a moment to mention it very, very quickly. For the incompressible case, it means that you've got the pressure divided by, by, by density plus the square root of velocity divided by 2 minus the, the potential of the potential forces uh, is, is a constant value on a given, on a given streamline. Very, very often used in fluid mechanics. Uh, I will not go into that today. We will have, certainly, we will have at least one, uh, one numerical problem that you will be solving that um, where you will need to use the Bernoulli equation in a more elaborate way. What I mean is that we will be dealing with, uh, with um, viscous losses. That, so we will add one additional viscous term to, to, to account for viscous losses in the Bernoulli equation. Uh, and we will be dealing with the... Disconnected. And we will be dealing with the change in, uh, in the density of the fluid. So we already see that we will be having some nonlinearity 
when it comes to the uh, different velocities along the channel at different at different locations uh, along the x coordinate so we will be having something more sophisticated than represented by the Bernoulli equation by, but not for for today um, so I have mentioned what I do not want to mention so let's focus back on the on the Navier-Stokes uh, equation of motion as I said it needs to represent the Newton's second law so what basically a Navier-Stokes equation is so we need to again look at this quantity u and plug something reasonable here and something reasonable is let's change u if the Navier-Stokes represents conservation of mechanical momentum this means that we need to replace it by density times velocity okay let's do this maybe not the whole derivation uh, but just a part of it so if we substitute that we come up with rho times velocity times derivative plus and it's the smart thing right now we need to go deeper into the uh, tensor algebra because to write it properly so that it expands properly this means that we need to write velocity dyadic product uh, with density times velocity it's again is the convective term so first so to say momentum it can change uh, with respect to time and momentum is transported with the flowing fluid by convection uh, but also um, yeah um, but also there is diffusion of momentum and what just let me make one comment how do you diffuse momentum you diffuse momentum by having some internal forces in the fluid so without going into the um, into the um, strain stress correlations the stress strain correlation for a fluid for a linear fluid Newton fluid stress strain correlation uh, can be written like that you got some tensor that represents the internal forces the internal uh, general yeah the internal forces well, not only viscous forces is the pressure times the unit tensor plus by definition 2 times the dynamic viscosity and it's dynamic viscosity not the kinematic viscosity times the uh, tensor that represents the deformation of the velocity field uh, so basically the strain tensor uh, the, to have the complete definition the ij component of this uh, of a strain tensor is dui <coughs> dxj plus duj dxy uh, so it, it represents how the velocity field is deformed and if you've got some deformation in the, in the velocity field this, this implies the appearance of the viscous forces uh, so this term of the um, T tends to represent the viscous forces this one is, uh, is isotropic it represents the uh, Pascal pressure, pressure forces so again what we need to do is we need to plug this to be the diffusion term so we put it we need to write is the divergence of the T tensor so let me write it this way that is just minus divergence of pressure times the unit tensor 
plus divergence divergence of uh, two to uh, dynamic viscosity strain tensor. What can we have more? Sir. Yeah, what does it? External forces? Exactly. It accounts for external forces. F0. Uh, great. If anyone is interested in expanding this term step by step, uh, I've got it in the notes. Uh, if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy. Well, it's not very complicated, but I don't think I want to spend time moving doing that at the, at the whiteboard, it will be not the most important thing for our uh, future discussions. Um, so I want to come up with the form that we are generally using. Um, and, that one, and that one is something like that. Uh, plus, after some simplifications, we can take out the, the density field out of the integration uh, times velocity times the gradient of velocity, so is the nonlinear term in the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, equals minus gradient of P plus the divergence of 2 mu the tensor plus, um, yeah, okay, it depends how you, how you, um, how you define this, this battle force, um, but generally, but generally the dimension of F0 is something, the dimension of the acceleration, uh, so then you need to plug density here. So do not be misled by that change. It, it, it depends how you define the, the body force. Mm. Okay, good. Uh, very, very often, very, very often people, especially in the incompressible flows world, they do the following transformation. Mainly we, we divide the whole equation by density. So we come, what you come up with is dv dt plus velocity times the gradient of velocity equals uh, minus 1 divided by rho gradient of pressure field plus divergence uh, plus divergence of 2 times mu times t plus the battle force. Um, again, again, this one right now, mu is the kinematic viscosity of the dynamic viscosity. So the kinematic viscosity mu is uh, mu divided by rho meter square per second. Uh, well, if someone is interested, dimension of phi is Pascal times second. Um, yeah, very, very commonly used form. If you're dealing with incompressible flows, um, I would suggest using this form is very, very often is, you know, more convenient for numerical methods, uh, especially, um, especially, well, very, very often in, in compressible flows because you see that's the only place where rate density appears. Very, very often P is, 
is defined as the pressure divided by, by density, and this one is completely omitted. Uh, it's a convenient way to write many numerical codes for incompressible flows, um, but it's not very convenient for, for uh, engineering simulations, since uh, if you've got uh, a code that already says that P is really physical pressure divided by density, um, you can quickly run into problems when calculating forces because you will you will forget that it's divided by density. Uh, then you need to multiply the the viscous forces also by by density, and it's probably easy to spot that you did something wrong if you deal with water because having uh, forces one thousand times smaller or, or larger we you would probably see that, but if you're dealing with uh, with air, you've got just the density of 1.225 or something like that, then you, you wouldn't even notice that, but you've got the wrong results. Mm. Uh, I have one mm -hmm. remark. Uh, yeah. As far as I remember, in the convective term, it's not velocity times gradient of velocity, but it's product vector product of velocity and nabla, in the uh, uh, this uh, one, yeah, it should be in the. Uh, for instance. I know what you mean. You mean something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Actually, even more correct, because if you strictly apply the tensor algebra to that, uh, I think you will still come, or maybe in this case, you would come up with the result but I think in the more correct way of writing same is it's like that and it yeah. and it matters yeah. I mean the order matters uh, yes you're right let's leave it like that because it, it's it's not very um, it's very it, it's not very nice to say that but we know what we mean, uh, and very, very often it's written in this order, although, yes, strictly applying the, the mathema mathematical transformations, you would need to have it in, the, in a different order. Uh, okay, so let's continue what we've been saying about the, about the Natty-Stokes equations. Mm. Let me, we, we finished with this vector notation, uh, but let me rewrite it um, in a scalar notation. I don't need this one. Uh, okay, so so what does it mean if we want to split it into into scalar velocity comp components? This means that this one would be written as dv well dv x dt plus dx dv x dx plus dy dvx dy plus vz dvx dz equals, sorry, uh, density, 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 uh, minus dp dx plus Um, well, if we do the, um, if we assume that the viscosity is constant, then what we've got here is nothing else like the uh, dynamic viscosity of the second derivative of Vx 
with respect to x, uh, x variable, second derivative of vx with respect to y variable. Well, so basically, the Laplace operator plus the external forces, uh, sorry, not, not the vector, f0, 0x. Zero, zero um, well, you can write the same for the y component and for the z component. Let's do it just for the y component because I've got a specific reason to do that. Uh, but I think everyone interested can do it for the z variable. Well, if you are interested. Uh, yeah. dpy dz equals minus dp dy plus viscosity Laplace operator applied to the y component of the velocity field plus for the z component Plus, what else do we need? Great. So the continued equation in this three-dimensional case goes dvx dx plus dvy dy plus dvz z equals zero. And right now I want, to, uh, I want to discuss a couple of physical cases that might be, that might be interesting when developing uh, custom models. And you, you will be laughing because you will see one of the most, uh, most um, popular examples that one of our colleagues has been using that, you've, you, you, you've been always laughing at him that, that you can, almost every flow you can approximate by a flat plate. Yeah. Um, so we will come to this moment as well. But let's start with the channel flow. Or a pipe flow. Uh, in a regular university course, we would simply use these form of equations to, to solve for the channel flow or the pipe flow. Let me omit that because we would need to have like one hour of the lecture to, to do it. Uh, and I rather want to focus on the, on the conclusions that, that, that follow. Mm. Let's just see what we can do. If we see the channel flow, I'm already revealing the solution that you certainly know that for a laminar channel flow, you will end up with the, with the parabolic distribution of the velocity in one direction and completely, uh, so, so that's, that's the distribution of the x component of velocity and the y component of velocity will be completely zero in the whole domain. Uh, but just see what we can do if then it's our general form of the Navier-Stokes equation. What, what will be evident is we've got no time, time dependence, so this term would disappear. Um, then what you can also see that, well, if you've got flow along, a steady flow along the um, x-coordinate, then you can assume that um, the velocity distribution does not change with respect to x, so this one will disappear. Um, you can also see that see that there is no cross flow, so v y disappears. V z would be in the even that, uh, in the other direction. This one would disappear as well. There is clearly some uh, pressure um, pressure change along the along the flow. Then this term must must represent must. Um, um, must account for all viscous losses. So 
everything what generates pressure drop in such a flow would be, uh, would be caused by, by this term. Uh, but basically, this one will not be present since we have already stated that uh, Vx does not change long x. So, so the second derivative uh, is also zero. Um, but this one is clearly not zero. If we've got parabolic uh, velocity distribution that then this one is, is the only term that is, that is responsible for generating the pressure drop along the flow. And, and this one, there is no, no, no variation of uh, x velocity with respect to the z variable. And we can assume that there, is, that there are no forces. Uh, sometimes you can use it. It's one of the numerical tricks, especially in the computations, for example, in the lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, if you want to apply periodic boundary conditions to solve for an infinite channel, because you want to, to solve the developed, um, developed flow, then what you could do is say that this here and here you've got the boundary conditions, so whatever flows out goes into here. But what's the problem? Uh, you, you don't have any way to specify the inlet velocity or something like that. So what's a good solution? Well, having zero here, zero here is a perfect, perfectly good solution, but probably not the most interesting for you. Uh, so what you could do to, to, um, to accelerate the flow in such a case is you could use this term actually with whatever value just to accelerate, just to keep the flow moving despite the pressure drop and the viscous forces that are generated, that are generated on the walls. Uh, one of the tricks. Um, further, I want to, I want to, um, I want to turn your attention to the fact that, as already said, this one, this one represents all the friction, uh, friction forces that are, uh, that are generated. And obviously the friction forces, like, okay, the Navier-Stokes equation represents uh, also all the internal forces in the fluid, but specifically it represents the forces that appear uh, at the boundary of the domain. So at the boundary of the domain, that's clearly the material force that is, uh, that is transported on the wall. Uh, and at the boundary of the domain, it's not, even, uh, it's not the internal force anymore, it's the external force. So coming back to classical mechanics, it means that generally no internal forces can, can impact the amount of momentum inside of the system, if, if the system is insulated, uh, but the external forces, they do, can change the, the amount of momentum. Uh, and what happens is that this friction losses, uh, the friction forces uh, on the wall, they need, to, they need to be balanced by, by this term, and you would see that, well, you have got, let's say, some pressure let's say it's zero pressure or whatever pressure here, you need to have some larger pressure value here. And what certainly needs to be the fact is that, well, let's call the pressure difference from here to here just by delta P. And let's say that you've got some surface area S. So Obviously, pressure difference multiplied by surface area that represents a force, uh, and this force need to, needs, to be, needs to be fully balanced in the steady case, needs to be fully balanced by the external forces that you apply due to friction. Uh, so you got one and the second wall, so two walls times the uh, friction forces times, let's say, the 
the surface area of these walls. Uh, a completely natural observation, nothing, nothing strange, but I will refer to it once again later when, when discussing some numerical uh, issues. Uh, that's why I wanted to mention it here. Uh, also, when we've been talking about the equations and the, and the um, differential formulation, it's time to mention how to, how to compute this this friction losses and the general way to compute that is saying that it's, uh, sorry, minus unit normal vector, again, the unit normal vector pointing outwards uh, times, the, times the term that we've been using to represent the viscous forces in the fluid. Uh, I think it's the right way, it's the right way to write it. Mm, what it means in such a case, in such orientation of the coordinate system, this means that we can write tau equals to minus me d vx dy. So it's saying that, again, a clear, clear thing from fluid mechanics course is that the amount of the friction that is generated uh, and transported, exerted onto the wall um, is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid and is proportional to the, to the gradient of the uh, Vx component of velocity with respect to the, to the, um, to the coordinate that, uh, that points in the direction perpendicular to the wall. Okay, mm. then coming to some tricks and gaining some intuition about the flow. Channel flow is obviously one of the simplest uh, analytical solutions that you can come up with. Um, now, channel flow is one of these uh, representative flows. The other would be flat plate. Uh, flat plate meaning that you've got some accelerated fluid flow here then at a certain point, uh, uh, yeah, at a certain point, the, the flat plate um, is, is put into the fluid and then the boundary layer starts developing. It grows at, well, somewhere it's, well, it grows all the time, but, um, yeah, but the, 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 the beginning is probably the most interesting one. Uh, but generally, you've got, I think, even analytical uh, solutions. They, they look like having it approximated from the experiment, but I think these are um, analytical solutions uh, done at certain, for certain assumptions. Anyway, uh, I want to keep these two examples in mind because for many, many cases where you need to make some first guesses and assumptions, really, believe me or not, many fluid flow examples can be, well, reasonably approximated by channel flow at first guess or flat plate, especially if you're interested in just having some estimations at the boundary uh, or, 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 yeah, especially the friction forces uh, that could work. Mm. Okay, if we have covered that, then it's time to define the um, friction coefficient. And like with every force coefficient, this means that you take the force and divide it by dynamic pressure, and the dynamic pressure is uh, one half density v squared, which velocity? The one that is defined. 
generally, well, generally what is assumed is you take the, uh, the free stream velocity. Uh, and I think for the channel flow, well, oh, for the channel flow, I think it's not that obvious which one you, you use because you could define the bulk velocity. The bulk velocity is uh, what is the average velocity that would give you the same, the same amount of the, um, um, of the mass flux through the boundary. So for the parabolic case, it's two-thirds of the maximum. You can calculate that. Uh, but I would say even for the channel flow, it's not self-evident if you take for the definition, uh, do you take the average one, the bulk velocity, or maybe you want to take the maximum. Uh, probably you take the bulk velocity. Uh, but it's really important to check what is taken as the, as the free stream velocity. For the flat plate, uh, example, it's pretty obvious. This this might this must be the the free stream velocity. But obviously, what I want to to underline is that if you need to calculate the velocity at some point along the flat plate, it's certainly not taking the velocity from you know somewhere here. Is the is the free stream velocity? Um, having said that. Um, for the, for the flat plate, for uh, a pretty wide range of tur turbulent Reynolds numbers, uh, you can see the correlation that says it's 0 0.0592 times the Reynolds number based on the x coordinate uh, to the power of minus uh, one fifth. Uh, what is the Reynolds number based on the x coordinate? It's taking the free stream velocity times the linear scale, and the linear scale usually it's like the width of the of the channel or something like the diameter of the pipe. But in this example, you need to take the the x coordinate. So as you see, the Reynolds number based on the x coordinate does change along the flat plate. It's zero at the beginning and it grows uh, divided by kinematic viscosity mu. Um, any questions? Keep that in mind. Uh, you will spot many, many examples uh, we will be doing a couple of, uh, of our numerical problems uh, that where I think you will be able to use that to approximate your flow in a reasonable way. And especially like in engineering, if you've got some free stream flow, you, you can't probably guess much about that. But maybe you can if, you, if you're interested in what can happen at the beginning of some, well, airfoil, uh, whatever, whatever wall that you have in, in your flow, this might be a good approximation to what happens at the, at the beginning uh, in the starting phase, um, at the beginning of this, uh, of this geomet geometric obstacle. Obviously, what happens past the the obstacle will be governed by, by turbulent effects and, and you won't get, guess much about that. Um, but for reasonable assumptions at the beginning, you can still do that. Mm, all right. Uh, then, And remember that these viscous forces and the representation of gradients, for this, for this case, only the friction forces uh, contribute to the pressure drop along the flow. Uh, so having the friction forces and the gradients resolved properly in the numerical method uh, is absolutely crucial to having correct value of the pressure drop. Um, 
boundary conditions. Uh, I actually skipped that when already discussing that with you, but what are the boundary conditions that you need to specify for such a problem? Wall. And what kind of boundary condition do you specify at the wall? No slip condition. Yeah, exactly. No slip condition. So at the wall, we say that the velocity, the whole velocity vector is completely zero. And do you specify anything more for the pressure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, often you can do that, like for incompressible flows. I think it's probably numerically the most stable pair of boundary conditions. So specifying velocity at the inlet, specifying the pressure at the outlet. Having other things is generally possible, but you may run into numerical instabilities. Especially if you define pressure and pressure here, it's possible, it can be done. Very, very often it can generate instabilities uh, at the inflow, so really problematic. Um, having generated, um, um, imposing the velocity boundary condition here and velocity boundary condition here is generally also possible, but does anyone know what kind of problem it causes? Kind of. Uh, the problem is, the problem is that if you have look, if you take a look at the at the Navier-Stokes equation uh, for the incompressible case, pressure, pressure as a function, not as the derivative of pressure, pressure does not exist anywhere in the equation. So what it means, if you've got one solution for pressure, say, 1,000 pascals, then the exactly the same solution, just 1,000 pascals higher in pressure, is same good. So like there is, uh, there is singularity in the system, uh, and every pressure level is okay, until you specify what's the pressure at some point in the domain like having it zero, having one million or one billion is same good, and having one billion in the numerical code, you can already imagine what this will happen from iteration to iteration. Don't know, probably it depends on the numerical scheme that you're using. Um, you see that what well, generally happens is you've got these three types of boundary conditions in, in differential equations that you can choose from. Uh, so having a mass flow boundary condition probably means some, some tricks. Some tricks, uh, because it's not how you define it mathematically. It, you need to, you know what you want to achieve so I, I don't know how they really work, for example, in ANSI Flint and, and how they are defined. But one of the things that I can imagine is, okay, you can, for example, apply pressure and pressure boundary condition, make it somehow work in a stable way. And okay, let's then make a yet another numerical procedure that, that automatically adjusts the pressure at the inlet in such a way that you finally come up to the, to the velocity field that, that generates exactly this amount of mass flow rate that you're seeking to have. So it, it's not a natural way of you know, defining the boundary conditions for the fluid flow, it's rather what you want to solve for in the engineering application and then you probably use some maybe bisection or something like that to to you know, iterate over different pressure values to, to see how much uh, mass flow rate it generates. Mm. 
let me rewrite the, the equation once again and comment on that. I think right now uh, we are at the most important part because uh, the concluding remarks are that what will be what will be important for your work and these are the most important things to to be aware of. Um, okay. I will write as as you want it to have. Mm. Let's write it with the Laplace operator uh, plus the body force. And as we said, for the incompressible case, uh, we have such a set of, band, uh, of equations. Mm. Okay, and let me resta restate that. The Navier-Stokes equation looks like a general con conservation law. It's got the time derivative of the velocity so basically, it's the uh, equation for the evolution of the velocity field. And that's fine. We, we really like evolution equations. Uh, the problem is here that we haven't got any equation for pressure. And as I said, pressure exists only as the, as the derivative. Uh, we have absolutely no equation for the evolution of the pressure field. What we've got is the... Um, is the condition that requires that the uh, divergence of velocity is zero. And it already causes many, many numerical problems when, um, when dealing with solution procedures for, for Navier-Stokes equations. Because we can't really solve for pressure, uh, we need to find pressure in such a way that it fulfills this, uh, this requirement. Um, we will be talking later about the, the um, features of the matrices that come up from different, uh, from different physical problems. But what we will be dealing here is we will have the matrices that, that are characteristic for optimization problems with equality constraints. And they are actually pretty difficult to be solved. Uh, they... they is the class of problems referred to as uh, saddle point problems. And many, many numerical procedures for solving linear equations will fail. Uh, the classical iterative uh, solvers like Jacobi, Gauss, Zeidel, etc. will fail. Why? They will fail because if you have a look at the matrix structure, for the 2D case, it means that you've got, okay, you, you, you've got your vector of unknowns, you've got the Vx component of velocity, Vy component, and you've got some portion of the uh, unknown vector that needs to represent pressure. And what you see is like the matrices, if you, if you discretize the Navier-Stokes equations, you will have some values here, 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 and it's everything okay. The problem is that discretizing this, this requirement means that you've got something that, uh, that is applied to that. You've got something that is applied to that. But here, you've got the block of zeros. And because of this block of zeros, it's extremely inconvenient for, ver for, for many, many numerical solvers, like the classical iterative solvers for, for linear um, systems of equations, like Jacobi will fail because they need to divide something by the element that is on the main diagonal. And you've got zero. Yeah.
Uh, not really, because first of all, you're changing something that probably wouldn't be the greatest problem because you're adding something really small. Uh, but I think it's extremely prone to numerical instabilities there then because you're dividing by something that is very, very, very small and that is something arbitrarily slow, small. So I think you can om generate almost every, every result. Uh, no, so it doesn't work. And like some direct solvers like Gaussian elim elimination we work but Gaussian elimination is the, the worst choice that you can make for solving any larger uh, system of, uh, of linear equations. Uh, so let's leave it for later on. But you need to be aware that they pose many difficulties and it's called, um, such matrices also, also um, come up as the result of the saddle point problems in optimization with equality constraints because of the divergence-free requirement is really like an like an equality constraint for the whole system. Um, equations, oh, sorry, questions? <laughs> Already too much. No questions, some equations? No? Mm. Okay, then one more comment. We are not giving a, a turbulence modeling class today, although we might want to do uh, such a course as well. But before we do a turbulence modeling course, just, give me, just let me give you some, some information about turbines modeling in such a system. Uh, I will only change something to the more general form. Uh, it's nicely written here, but I want to have the density. Mm. And I want to do it differently. Namely, let's stick back to the divergence uh, of the body force. Again, this one is nice because it does not assume that you've got constant uh, viscosity. Uh, and as I said, for the advection diffusion equation for heat transfer, etc., it's really nice to get used to the to the formulation that the diffusive, diffusive effects in any uh, conservation law are, are represented by divergence of, uh, of some flux. Uh, anyway, how do you account for turbulence? Generally in turbulence modeling, you are, especially when talking about Rand's average, Rand's uh, Reynolds average and average Stokes equations, uh, this means that you're interested in solving for the averaged flow. Like obviously, turbulence has got many, many uh, turbulent fluctu fluctuations. You're not interested in fluctuations themselves because they are, because they are um, chaotic. Uh, you're interested in the statistical features of the averaged flow. Uh, so what's the change then? The change is that, first of all, you don't solve for physical velocity, but you're solving for some average velocity. Well, this one is also based on the average velocity. Well, but turbines generally introduces some additional friction in the system. Uh, or say it differently, not only friction, but generally it introduces a lot of mixing. A lot of mixing, mixing of everything, like mixing of the thermal energy if you're solving the heat transfer problem, but also mixing of the, of the mechanical momentum if you're solving just the pure fluid flow problem. Uh, so you, you need to account for this enhanced mixing somehow in your equation. And how do you do that? 
where you simply adjust the viscosity properly so that you, so that you represent the turbulent field. Uh, 30 hours of lectures, we could be giving about how to choose proper uh, viscosity um, coefficient, but what you change in the formulation is you add something like that. You've got the physical, uh, physical viscosity, dynamic viscosity, plus you apply something that you call turbulent, turbulent uh, viscosity. Turbulent viscosity is not a constant. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly, it's a highly, mm, well, there is huge distribution. There are, there are huge differences in the values of, um, of um, turbulent viscosity from point to point. Uh, and they're usually many, many times larger than the, uh, than the values of physical velocity, uh, viscosity. Uh, for um, RANS modeling, so what you got used to using K epsilon, K omega models, etc. Uh, this is usually 100 to even a couple of thousand times larger than the physical value of, of viscosity. There should be. There should be. Mm. Okay, any questions? Remember that if you're uh, solving for temperature field, um, mass diffusion, some passive scalar transport. So maybe some, you need to model the um, water vapor distribution to calculate humidity and you're dealing with a turbulent flow. This means that all the diffusion coefficients need to be enhanced in the turbulent, in the turbulent calculation by well, some combination of the, of the turbulent viscosity. There ways to, 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 to use the turbulent viscosity to calculate diffusi uh, diffusivity constants. Well, not constants, diffusivity coefficients. Is there a number? Yeah, there is like, uh, it depends on the phenomenon, but for heat transfer, uh, the parental number is something that, that associates viscosity with thermal diffusivity, uh, and it does not apply for turbulence only. It's generally prant number is defined as as the ratio of the uh, oh I never I, I never remember in which direction, but I think it's it's the relation between the kinematic viscosity divided by by um, by thermal diffusivity is the prant number. If you're discussing the diffusion effects, so you've got mass diffusion of one species in the whole mixture, uh, then it's, it, it relates to the Schmidt number. Okay, questions? Great, so let's move on to modeling of the porous media flows. Who's already familiar with porous media flows? That's good. Um, the majority will get to know something new. Okay, porous media. Porous media flow means that you've got some domain and you've got something in the domain. Well, you've got some internal structure, you've got some pores. Uh, plenty of things can be approximated this way, like filters, rocks, where you've got um, 
gas and oil flow through the rocks. Uh, well, what, what else? You can have many, many engineering structures that you generate on purpose like that. Uh, well, radiators. Radiators, may, one, uh, it depends on the case, but maybe you're interested really in solving the flow through the, through the radiator, or you maybe only want to, to get to know how the radiator works in the whole system, uh, and then you're probably not so much interested in, in, in resolving for, for the details of the flow and heat transfer, but you're rather interested in what, in what macroscopically happens uh, um, in this component. So, so then also um, assuming that the radiator is a porous media is a nice approximation of the reality. Um, we, the flow in porous media is often described by Darcy's law. And Darcy's law says the following thing, that you can calculate some uh, volumetric flux by saying that it is directly proportional to the permeability of the porous media divided by uh, viscosity, dynamic viscosity, times the pressure gradient. So what it basically says is, okay, if you apply pressure gradient from here to here, you will generate flow this way through the porous media, through the porous medium. Uh, the flow will be the, will be the, uh, the slower, the larger the viscosity values, like pretty, pretty intuitive. Like if you take honey, uh, it won't probably go very smoothly uh, or quickly. Uh, it's directly proportional to the permeability of the porous media. It's also clear like you've got something that is very, very, you know, dense. It's, it's got very, very tiny pores. It's very difficult to push the fluid uh, through that. If you've got something that is, you know, largely open, but it's got some very, very loose structure, then it's much, much easier to, to put it. Filtration, like you, you might know the, the, the water taken from the rivers, one of the stages of filtration is really, un, un, until, to, until today, it's like, putting it through sand. Um, so, yeah, you can also, here, uh, you can also filtrate it. Um, and, and sand is, a, well, perfectly is represented as a, as a porous medium. Uh, some definitions. So for most of you, it's not a known topic then. Um, K is called permeability. The SI unit is meter squared. But what kind of, for a rock, what kind of values this might have? Do you remember? Okay. Uh, okay, it's for a rock. So let, let's say rock is, is not the most um, permeable medium in the world, um, but it's important, to, it's important to remember that permeabilities can be really extremely low in value. Um, and I want you to keep this in mind when developing any numerical code. Because again, based on the, um, on the precision, precision of representation, the floating point numbers in the computer memory, on the uh, round of errors uh, made by, by the linear or nonlinear solvers, and having some probably high pressure differences, like maybe a couple of thousand or even a couple of megapascals, then having in one numerical code 10 to the power of minus 9 and 
10 to the power of plus 6 uh, does not sound like a particularly good idea. Mm. Uh, one more comment from me. When you're developing any code for any application, Tip. I want to make it correct. Actually, when we dance, it is 10 to the minus plus. So it's even nicer. Right. Uh, one, one comment. If you're developing any code and you refer to these differential models that we, we've covered at the beginning, like you, very, very often you will be writing codes for, for Poisson, Laplace, equation, advection, diffusion, etc., and linking it somehow to your mathematical model, uh, then the tendency is that you start with, with constants like 1, uh, and you check if your numerical procedure works. Uh, never do that during the project. Like, it's fine to write the first code and input like one, because it's, it's easy to check, and it's fine, do it. Uh, but once you do it, then the next step is absolutely necessary. Check it for the more or less reasonable values that you will have in your simulation and in your case that you need to, to work for. Believe me, we could remind some stories like that probably a couple of years ago uh, in the beginning of quick sim development where we needed to work for a long time uh, when moving from perfectly working code for coefficients like one to, to this coefficient that we were interested in. Um, so nothing wrong about writing for one uh, but but change it as quickly as like immediately immediately change to uh, to to something reasonable. You may not know the um, the exact coefficients from the customers. Uh, it doesn't need to be you know five times ten to the power of minus twelve, but let it be in the order of ten to the power of minus twelve. It's it's already fine. Mm. Next thing, okay, this one is uh, mm, dynamic viscosity, nothing uh, particularly uh, surprising. Uh, this one has got a couple of different names. Well, generally what it is, or first the names. Uh, one of the names is superficial, superficial velocity. Uh, another name that I have found is uh, instantaneous instantaneous flux, or it's discharge per unit area. Uh, now the intuition: what it is. It's nothing else as the volumetric flux divided by some um, surface area. Generally, if we imagine having flow from here to here, it means that if you imagine certain cross-section area, capital A, then Q is defined as the, actually, is defined as velocity superficial velocity that represent how much volumetric flux goes through such a cross-section, assuming, assuming that you've got only fluid in your system. So that's why it's superficial velocity. If your porous media is, is, is only porous, like there is really no solid inside, uh, then it's obviously the same as having physical velocity. But imagine that you've got such a dense structure that only, let's say, 100 uh, of the space is occupied by the fluid and 99% is occupied by the solid. 
So a superficial velocity uh, shows you how much volumetric flux is really transported for the, through the porous medium, but the, what's the actual physical velocity? It, it's 100 times larger. Uh, and this brings us to the next um, thing, phi, porosity. And porosity is defined as the volume of pores to the total volume of the um, total volume of the uh, element of the domain. Uh, again, this one is the superficial velocity. You can also see, you can also be interested in having the value of the physical velocity. Uh, that's nothing else as dividing the superficial velocity. So what, what it is, it's actually like the bulk velocity. Um, and dividing it by porosity. Questions? No, pores power, are empty. Okay. Solid is solid. So basically, porosity, if uh, zero is just solid, and this one is just uh, huge without any structure. Exactly. Porosity one is you've got only pores and no structure. Porosity zero means you've got absolutely no space for the fluid. It's the real physical velocity. Um, this one, the Darcy slow, applies for, for slow flows. Uh, if you've got flows with higher velocities, depends what, what means high velocity in which case, uh, then the quadratic law applies. And such a quadratic law is referred to as Darcy's Forsheimer law. And let me rewrite that. Well, okay, it's, it's actually same written a bit differently. See, you can write this law for uh, how the flux, how the flow flux depends on the pressure gradient, or you can write it different uh, the other way around. Like, what kind of pressure gradient is generated by a, by a certain um, flow? And this one will be written the other way around stating that the pressure gradient equals minus density, uh, sorry, viscosity divided by permeability times the um, discharge per unit area. So that's nothing else than the regular Darcy's law. Um, and this is the linear term. Nothing has changed until now. Minus density divided by K sub 2 times um, flux squared. This needs to give you the quadratic relation. And actually, it's, it's not surprising either. If you've got uh, high velocity flows, then not only viscous forces contribute to the pressure drop, but also inertial forces and the inertial effects contribute to the pressure drop, and they are ex expressed and described by the, by the quadratic parabolic uh, relation. Uh, the problem with that is that 
this one does not generate the vector. So we need to, so we need to write here something that will give us proper, uh, proper um, direction. And a stupid way, but a correct way to write it. So you need to have it against the vector and divided by, by its length to have the unit normal vector. Mm. As said, if you're interested in, uh, okay, Th that's it. Questions? Hmm? It's like the magnitude of the vector. This one with that? No, we... And no, because you really want... You want to generate the unit normal vector that is, that is along the... Okay, you, you mean like dropping this one? Yeah. Yeah, you can write. Mm. Yeah. What? Hmm? K2? Uh, is the other coefficient in the model? <laughs> so, so, so that so that your results uh, match the reality. But I think it's exactly the same. Like it's, it's the funny way to answer your question. But but I think it's exactly the same here. For for some you know very regular forms, like maybe having small tubes in a large volume. You, would, you could use the Navier-Stokes solution for the pipe and generate the permeability, uh, yeah, the permeability coefficient well, by hand. You could do that, but if you've got some well, funny structure that, that, is, that, that does not, uh, that is like nothing alike, uh, then you really need to measure that. And it, it's the same with this case up to. The good question, the, the good thing, however, is let's see what happens if we let's see what happens if we assume that oh, f first. Um, based on the Darcy's law, and based on that, let's see what the physical velocity. The physical velocity is obviously minus one divided by, divided by porosity times viscosity divided by permeability. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I was trying to do two things at the same time. Yes. Times the pressure gradient. And now, if we are dealing with the liquid, what does need to hold for the physical velocity? Exactly. Like if we're dealing with the liquid, it's incompressible. So, and, and under, I underline that, physical velocity uh, needs to have zero divergence. Well, superficial velocity does not need to have zero divergence uh, field. So if we apply divergence to the both sides of this equation, what we come up with is, um, okay, let me write it this way. Uh, 
and we know it's zero. What is it? Laplace equation. Exactly. It's a Laplace equation. It's a Laplace equation, and so it's really extremely easy to, to solve it. So unlike like for the Navier-Stokes case, where it was extremely difficult to solve it with many, many numerical problems about the solid point problem uh, features of the matrix. Uh, here it's extremely easy to solve the boundary conditions. You can, you can uh, apply whatever you want, some velocity, boundary condition at one side, maybe the pressure at the other side. Obviously, we, we, we run into the same problems like for each pressure level, it's also good if you don't specify pressure at some boundary. Uh, but it's, it's easy to just determine the pressure level. Uh, so, so this goes well. Um, well, typically, viscosity will be a constant. Uh, if you've got the, a porous medium with of the same structure, then the permeability and the porosity may be a constant as well. Uh, but well, consider that because you might have you might have porous media where you know some very 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 dense structure in some portion of that, and completely different structure in the other area. Um, and then obviously the porosity and, and permeability is a scalar field, each of them, and, and needs the to be. That's also true. That's also true. Um, and I've got it on the next page in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, questions? Okay, then two more um, physical and numerical comments. As Piotr mentioned, the perma permeability does not need to be a scalar, and often it's, it's not. Um, so generally, permeability can be a tensor. Exactly. Uh, with k11, k12, k13, k21, k22, k23, k31, k32, k33. Uh, in most cases, probably, if you've got different permeabilities in different directions, like what, what's a good example? Wood would be a good example. If you cut wood in the forest, then like along the axis, so to say, it, it transports media much, much better than across its layers. Uh, you will find many, many materials of that structure. Mm. Radiators. Radiators, what I mean, often in CFD, if you want to macroscopically see something, then we had simulations where we have been uh, simplifying uh, the radiators with the fins uh, as porous media. What we've been doing, obviously, we know that the flow through the, through the radiator goes relatively easily along the fins, and it doesn't go at all in the other direction. Uh, physically impossible. Uh, a good a good approximation of that is um, calculating proper permeability in one direction and putting something. Uh, Tim, your question about pressure and something very very small. This in this case, like saying that across the fins, it's like say 100 times more difficult. Like you will have some flow in the physically impossible direction, uh, but you need to find some reasonable trade of be between the um, conditioning of your, of your numerical problem, because having it one million times uh, more difficult to it would probably lead you into the numerical problems, but something between 100, maybe 1,000 times more difficult should, should work. Um, well, so like for example, wood, 
you'd probably have these three elements completely different in every direction. What do this account for? Mathematicians? These values on diagonal. Hmm? These values uh, on diagonal. Oh, off diagonal. Off diagonal terms. Like, imagine you've got, that one is probably exaggerated, uh, but imagine you've got zeros on the main diagonal, but you've got some off diagonal terms. What does it mean? That the pressure uh, gradient on the uh, other directions that consider it produce some flow. It means that applying such a pressure difference would induce flow, for example, in this direction. Like, strange. Uh, probably exaggerated, but I can already, I can already imagine for some you know, curved structures with some internal channels. Yeah, for example, if we have radiator with the uh, uh, obese... Uh, You've got fins like that yeah. in your structure. You apply such a pressure difference, obviously it induces some flow in this direction. But it's highly dependent on the current system that you will consider. Yeah. Because the same goes for, like, you mentioned wood trees. Yeah. So if you would go with cylindrical coordinate system in case of tree, then the material would be orthotropic. Uh, so you will only have no zero values on the diagonal. But yeah. if you would go with Cartesian, so you would have no zero uh, values of the diagonal. Yeah, it's like with every tensor orientation. Yeah. If you change the orientation of the coordinate system, then the elements in the tensor matrix, they do change. Uh, so obviously you need to properly tr uh, select the coordinate system that you're using. Um, the good thing about, um, about modeling porous media flows is that you actually have no, no real numerical problems. Like if you, if you only address the issue with extremely low permeabilities and possibly very high pressures, but you can do it by, by non-dimensionalizing um, the, the, the equations, if you address this issue, then you actually have no numerical problems with well, convective terms, non-linearities, no, like, just solve a linear system. Unless it's multiphase. Unless it's multiphase, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and if it's multiphase, don't, don't even touch it. Okay. Yeah. Can this tensor be non-symmetrical? Sorry? Can this tensor be non-symmetrical? Uh, I think in case of heat transfer it can be. Uh, I don't know. Because this would mean that... Yeah, what, what would it mean? That in one direction it is easier for you to push the heat or yeah. load down in the other way around. Yeah, for example, okay. if it's a yeah, So, be. yeah, exactly, when you would have, like, okay. test bubbles, and then if you would, like, make it in the circle, then in the one way it would be easier to push the fluid through it than in the other way, if you would look at it from the macroscopic scale. Okay. Then the answer is yes. Although I'm not really convinced. Well, what we can discuss that later yeah, because I'm I, not also 100% sure, but I think because, it's the case. I think because, like because I don't think, th because I don't think, but I'm not sure, I don't think that the tensor is basically a linear o o operation can, you know, can, can differentiate between basically the same direction but in the other with the other orientation I I think the non symmetric uh, rather mean that pressure gradient and in x coordinate generate 
y velocity, but pressure gradient in y velocity doesn't generate x velocity. Yeah, yeah, I think like the case with the Tesla valve would. Anyway, let's leave it for later discussions because I don't think we will re-experience problems like that. Um, yeah, it's a very, very nice academic question, but let's leave it for the coffee break. Yeah. Um, then, one more thing. Uh, having the in-purse media, we, we already are solving, for, for example, this. Um, the, it can be applied, for example, for oil and gas um, applications. Uh, and then, for example, the interface tracking of whatever it should be, oil, water, um, is an issue. Mm, and you might want to use the velocity fit in the porous medium to see what the free surface of any fluid contained within it. Um, I'm not going into the numerical details because, once again, it's, it's many, many things to, to be said about that. But I just want to uh, leave you with the reference that interface tracking. If you need to do that, you might be interested in reading about plic, plits. Uh, is the algorithm of piecewise linear uh, probably interface interface computation interface computation yeah I think so uh, it's I would say a geometrical method that is used in most uh, multiphase codes based on fine volumes but probably not only on fine on fine volumes that what it does is if you've got any mesh and you've got some x, y velocities and you had some well, bubble or whatever that you're representing, um, piecewise linear uh, interface computation attempts to do something like that, that if you advect your, uh, your bubble on the mesh, then this interfaces need to be regenerated like uh, piecewise in a piecewise linear manner in a way that in the next iteration you've got the same amount of mass in your calculation as as you had in in the previous iteration um, not, not not a very very sophisticated geometrically but I would say a, a longer reading before you understand all the details how to implement that. Um, you might also be interested in something that is called level set function. Level set function or level set method. Uh, level set function or level set method means that you are completely artificially, uh, you're completely artificially defining on your mesh in your domain a yet another field, say it capital Phi. Capital Phi um, is defined in a way that it's, say, uh, less than zero below the surface, more than zero above the great, um, yeah, more than zero above the surface, and then the interface is um, is represented by phi equals zero. So you can see that you can read re many, many bubbles you can, you can represent by having a level set function. Uh, simply you would have some well, bubbles and the interface is where, where it's exactly zero. Uh, and well, different approaches you might have you might have level set functions where we go to, let's say, minus one up to one, or even from zero to, to one, and the interface would be just half. 
um, one of the possible examples. But I think you can also define methods like that where you have completely arbitrary negative and positive values, uh, but you only need to account for the interface. Should you need it, look for details. Um,